Hello, welcome back to another chunk of Nine Lessons of Carols for curious slash socially distanced people. I'm not going to take too much of your time. Just enjoy watching Joshua Idahan, Jen Gupta and also Steve Mould. Um, I was going to, I've swapped my t-shirt, the first t-shirt of, of the day into a Charles Darwin t-shirt I mentioned before. Uh, this has always been one of my favourite things to read out. I've read from it many times, but it's part of the joy of human curiosity. And for anyone here who's ever read any of the books of Charles Darwin, and I would say I highly recommend, because I think because sometimes we're so fearful of not comprehending something or feeling that maybe we don't have the kind of brain that's, that's needed. And of course, you know, most of these things are actually very accessible. And Charles Darwin was was one of those writers who wrote so beautifully, so enthusiastically, but also always with a, a level of kind of doubtfulness, this beautiful scientific doubtfulness. And this book, which I mentioned at the beginning of the show, The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms with Observation on Their Habits, is the first Darwin book that I read in its entirety. I then went on to On Origin of Species and Descent to Man. But this... this is a, What I love about it is an old man. This is, this is the last book that Darwin wrote. And this shows that even... As an elderly man and someone who uh, had seen some some terrible things as well uh, in, in terms of loss, I and mean, any of you who have read the book Annie's Box, which is uh, all about the loss of his daughter as well about the creation of his ideas, uh, will will know that he and and his wife Emma Darwin, who is also a fantastic read. If you read a biography, make sure it's a biography that's got loads of stuff about Emma Darwin as well, because there's something very beautiful about their relationship. I think. But here was a man, an old man, who having looked at kind of all manner of bizarre behaviour in the living world and some very beautiful, a beautiful book about orchids as well, which are so called, ah, the most duplicitous of the flowers um, and uh, of course they're one of the, that's another, I was going to mention, Oliver Sacks, that's another book, uh, this is all it's going to be now for the next 23 hours is books that I've liked but Oliver Sacks, a book that was brought out after he died called Rivers of Consciousness which is him writing predominantly about William James and Charles Darwin he has this lovely story Oliver Sacks, of course, had a wonderful humanity. And uh, he talks about being a child and wandering around his garden and looking at the flowers. And much like when, when Chris had that moment of looking at the starry sky and thinking, why is it not light throughout the day and throughout the night? With Oliver Sacks, what it was, was he would look at things like magnolia plants and he would wonder why it was beetles that were crawling over those, but not bees. And it was when his mother explained to him for the first time, she said, well, what you can tell when you look at a flower being pollinated, any form of plant that has a pollination where it's an interaction with an insect, is the insect that will pollinate it will have evolved somewhere roughly around the same time, of course, as the plant. So the reason that with a magnolia plant you see a beetle, which would have evolved before uh, the bee, the reason that that is, is happening is because the magnolia, that evolved before the daffodil, for instance, and he just goes around the garden, he looks at all of these different insects and all of these different plants and the interaction between the two, and he starts to get this vision, the grand vision of how life grows together and the importance of the connection with so many different species. But this is, anyway, this book, though, Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms, what I love about this is that uh, here's an old man who starts to think about the worms in his garden. He's thought about orangutans in the past, he's thought about orchids, and now he's thinking about the worms. And he's thinking about how something that many of us might consider to be something mundane, oh, it's just the worms, how vital they are in digesting the soil, in churning the soil, in moving the soil, and all of this interaction that goes on. And so he started to do a series of experiments on earthworms uh, with his son, I think it was Leonard as far as I remember, and, uh, and I just find this very, very beautiful. Worms appear to be less sensitive to moderate radiant heat than to bright light. I judge of this from having held at different times a poker heated to dull redness near some worms at a distance which caused a very sensible degree of warmth in my hand. So many beautiful words in there. The, the, the sensible degree of warmth, the careful nature of holding a poker over a worm, near a worm, not to damage the worm, but just to get a sense of whether it detected heat. And then he thinks, once he's talked about detecting heat, he thinks, ah, but what about sound and so he sets up this beautiful experiment involving sound worms do not possess any sense of hearing they took not the least notice of the shrill notes from a metal whistle which was repeatedly sounded near them 
Now, isn't that that's an experiment anyone here and anyone watching you can do? All you need to get is a whistle and go out into your garden. And what a grand sight that is for any neighbours. Think of those, you know, those people on horses who rode past Darwin's garden, and there was an elderly man with that wonderfully kind of exuberant, frothy beard just standing, going beep, 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 beep. Nothing. Note that down, Leonard. Now. A lesser scientist would have gone, I've done the whistle test, that pretty much does it all. No, Darwin, as we know, was not a lesser scientist. He then moved on. Nor did they react to the deepest and loudest tones of a bassoon. Now, isn't that wonderful? Nature and bassoons. You could work on that, couldn't you? I mean, Steve, nature and bassoons. There is something. And so he got Leonard to play the bassoon, right? And again, he didn't stop there. Then he, they were indifferent to shouts. So there's all of these things going on. There's the whistle. There's the bassoon. There's the shouts. Again, we return to the importance of jazz in the natural sciences. Because I think that is how jazz began. As far as I know, someone rode past watching uh, a bassoon being played to a worm and went got an idea for a musical revolution that will probably really kick off sometime in the 1920s. That's right, Miles Davis started on the bassoon. Yeah, not true. But we did do that, we did do that one, we did do that bit. Um, do you remember we did, when you were reading from this book uh, some years ago, and we had Caroline Maybe, a brilliant comedian and also bassoonist, and she came and played live bassoon to some worms to see what would happen. I don't know if you, do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, no, I've, I've always, uh, th it's, th I like the fact that very often I've rung people up and they've gone, you want me to do what? <laughs> And they have enough trust to go, well, I presume it must be for some purpose. Yeah. Um, all of these shows only exist for the purpose of me finding out stuff. Um, and, uh, and then, yes, yeah, so they were indifferent to shouts. And then if, if care was taken, there's a beautiful thing here as well. When we took them in and began to play the piano to them. So poor Emma Darwin, all she's faced, and she goes, Charles, are you bringing in worms? No, I'm not going to any worms. No, 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 no. Bloody child. And it's a beautiful, that bit again of just thinking of play. This is a very important thing. In fact, the book that I've just been working later on, I might read out if we get a kind of technical hitch or something, because of this book, which I've accidentally written twice as many words as are required uh, by the publisher. I've, I might, I've just been hacking away at it, and I might read uh, a couple of bits from the chapters, which are predominantly about the fact doubt, humility, and play are all important parts of the scientific pro process. You know, that, that is the kind of joy of... And it's, I mean, I, I, I did uh, Mastermind, uh, recorded it a few weeks ago, and I think it's out sometime time in January and uh, I it was a very I had a conversation with John Humphreys you know in the middle of the kind of celebrity mastermind there's a little bit of a car and the conversations were so funny because all the conversations were wasn't it better in the old days <laughs> that was every single John Humphreys conversation now Lucy Porter you're doing a show about the brownies aren't you weren't they better in the old days uh, the, uh, Joe Pasquale you're a comedian why don't they do jokes anymore they were better weren't they and uh, and he kind of and he said to me he said you know isn't it a bit uh, demeaning and patronizing to people to in any way try and make out that you know science needs to be fun and I, I think that's exactly the opposite I think the thing that you know what we've tried to do with infinite monkey cage is make sure that people know that scientists are playful they couldn't be good science is always saying you know D Richard Feynman you know a lot of the things that so that yesterday we were recording a show about food and we suddenly started talking about that beautiful experiment Feynman one day was in his kitchen and he broke a stick of spaghetti and he said why is it broken into three pieces, not two? And he broke another one. He went, that's four, that's three. And eventually, he rang all the best minds in Cornell and said, come round immediately and bring as much spaghetti as you can. And they stood there breaking spaghetti and counting and trying to work out why. And they started mucking around with equations, going, why is it three or four pieces and never two pieces? And after a whole night of doing that, they got nowhere. But they had a fantastic bolognese, so there was still a treat, you know. That's kind of part of the joy of science. So we are now going to move on to uh, uh, well, someone who's an astrophysicist and who is now going to tell us a little bit about her youthful connection and the joy of astrophysics uh, mixed at the same time also with uh, her love of emo music. So uh, please welcome Jen Gupta. Hi everyone, as has probably just been said, my name is Jen and I'm an astronomer, but equally as important for the next seven minutes is that I would describe myself as an emo kid. I know I just said kid, I'm in my mid-30s and I have a kid myself, but musically I most identify with the music I listened to in the early 2000s when I was a teenager, which was this emo music. 
If you haven't come across emo before, um, if you weren't a teenager in the early 2000s, then emo is basically a genre of rock or alternative music, which I would say is characterised by really heartfelt lyrics. And if you've ever listened to emo, or you go away and listen to emo after this, one thing you'll notice is that us emo kids, we're really big on stars. Not just permanently inked on our skin, but also in the lyrics to our songs. And being the absolute astronomy nerd that I am, in recent years I found myself listening to these song lyrics and trying to work out how accurate the astronomy in them is. And so without further ado, I present to you today an astrophysicist analysis of astronomical song lyrics. Okay, let's get started. I've only got time for two. And so the first song I've gone with, I'll wipe off my Twitter handle. The first song I've gone with is by my current favorite artist, John Allison Weiss or AW. And they have a song called Motorbike, which has this line that says, seven million hours in my day, Time goes so slow since you went away. So let me just pop that up so we remember what we're talking about. Um, and the first time that I heard this song, it immediately set alarm bells ringing in my head because we can do the maths for it. We've actually got all the information in this lyric that we need. You see, the time you experience depends on how fast you're going, your speed and the faster you're going, the more time slows down. So we can actually do the maths for this, and that's why I've commandeered my toddler's whiteboard here. I'm working from home, so I don't have a normal whiteboard. I've got an easel precariously balanced on the sofa instead. But we can do the maths. So your time, T, that you experience, is related to your time at rest, or if you're, um, if you're still, um, which is T0 by this gamma factor here where gamma equals one over the square root of one minus V squared over C squared. So here your V is your velocity or your speed and C there um, is the speed of light. So now we have um, all the information we need. We just need to rearrange this equation, plug our numbers in and we can do it. So if we rearrange this equation, then we get V over C equals the square root of one, sorry, one minus T zero over T. And that's all squared. So let's plug our numbers in. According to this lyric down here, your time at rest, if you weren't moving, T zero is uh, one day, which is 24 hours. And the time you're experiencing moving apparently really fast on your motorbike, T is 7 million hours. And so that is 7 times 10 to the 6 hours. And so if we put these numbers into this equation here, we get a speed or a velocity that's 0 0.9999999. Two times c, so basically ninety nine point nine 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 four one two percent the speed of light. I think I got the right number of nines in there. So a pretty fast motorbike. I don't know of any motorbike that can go that fast at that speed in twenty four hours. You'd be well past Pluto and into the outer depths of the solar system in a day. So let's rub that one off. It's a fun lyric because it got us to do um, some maths. Uh, but the second song, I thought I'd get into the festive spirit. Um, and so I've selected a song by an artist called Chris Farron. Um, the song's called Merry Christmas Again. And in this song, Chris says, I'll be the sun, all mean and hot, and dying every day. So I'll pop that up there. So, is this true? We can look at this um, for the sun and for Chris, and we can see whether they meet these three um, properties. So the sun and Chris. So the first thing Chris says is that he can be like the sun, he can be mean. Is the sun mean? Well, 
the sun's a star it doesn't really show any characteristics or behavior um like humans do we can't say whether it's really mean or nice so i think i'd have to put a cross there chris unfortunately is chris farron nice well i don't know him personally um from his social media and what i've seen online he seems like quite a nice guy but you never know he might have a hidden mean side so i don't think we've got any evidence either way we better put a question mark in there okay the next one's a bit easier for the sun is the sun hot um that's clearly a yes put a big tick in there the sun's surface temperature about five and a half thousand degrees celsius that's an easy one to do is chris hot well at some level that's subjective but chris uh, last year released an album um, and that album if i bring it up on Bandcamp, is called born hot so i think we do have some evidence there that chris is hot um so we have to give him a tick there the last one dying that's not a very nice thing to think about um but you know the sun is technically dying it's about four and a half billion years old it's got another four and a half billion years to go it's about halfway through its life astronomers would say and we do talk about stellar death and stars dying so technically the sun yes is dying every day what about chris farron well chris farron's previous album was called chris farron can't die so again clear evidence there that chris can't die so vaguely astronomically accurate song lyric he's got two out of three for the sun not doing so well on himself but there we go as i said there are so many examples that i could have talked about but i'm out of time so i will finish there by reminding you that i've been dr jen gupta um astronomy is awesome emo is awesome and you can find me on the internet if you want to form an emo band together and write some astronomically accurate songs thank you so much thank you so much to jen uh and uh again jen is someone to to, to follow all of their work because there's always interesting things going up and uh i love doing things like that the exciting thing about this is sometimes you do something then you get rushed and it's very nice uh johnny brown who uh is uh, is, is a wonderful musician from the band of holy joy and does this great show on resonance fm called uh bad punk and uh, he just got in contact there was a poem i did earlier on and he went oh can i do a soundscape to that and that's one of the things that a lot of these shows have been about i hope is uh Lots of, you know, it's a beautiful thing when sometimes a scientist is looking at someone who's kind of playing the French horn and thinking, I wonder how I can use that in one of my lectures or whatever it is, all of that mixing up. Well, I remember one of the really early shows that we did um, back at the Bloomsbury and the, the backstage, it was when uh, Richard Dawkins was there. And I, I vi vividly remember him asking uh, Nathan Hamer about, his, about how the trombone works. Yeah. And, and having this just, I was sort of party to this mad conversation where Richard Dawkins was was the student and you know Nathan was 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 and Nathan the teacher. did actually say it was magic didn't he and and, and now Rich in his <laughs> lectures goes yeah. I believe of course that all science is very rigidly material apart from the trombone which is magical so uh, <laughs> that has led to him getting into some trouble uh, we're going to go live by the way I should explain to you, if you look at we we have an audience coming in uh, we've got got various different sections of uh, and at the moment the audience have uh, have have gone we're going to have a play and there's a half hour kind of cleaning period that goes on again for all of the different uh, acknowledging the uh, COVID protocol which is going on and uh, also a reminder to you of, uh, of the charities involved for this which are uh, Mind, Turn to Us, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières and uh, also uh, one of the King's Place uh, charities as well, musical charities. So you'll find out all about those things. I'm trying to work out, Steve and me are both rationing when to have a coffee so anyone who understands the best time to get a caffeine here, I have my last coffee at nine, well one coffee at 9.30, I'm beginning to debate whether to have another coffee today so anyone who actually will understand how that will work for me throughout a 25 hour period if you could tweet to nine lessons uh, 24 hashtag nine lessons 24 and tell me at what point i should have my next coffee and what point steve's allowed back and what point we're allowed to have one of those very small chocolates that they've got backstage yeah. little energy chocolates maybe a little bits of cream egg in them oh lovely we, i didn't realize we're yeah we've got to be very careful though yeah. if we overdo it early on we're in a kind of you know caffeine and candy frenzy and then it's just depleting 
depletion from that. Well, point. the crash after that, yeah, that's the, the coffee rationing is going to be a real challenge. I, I definitely think crowdsourcing the uh, the science of it. Would be yeah, fantastic. so if we could find that out, thank you very much, scientists. Now we're going to go over to someone who I think I first met at uh, the Latitude Festival. I think that was the very first time we worked together. And again, when I've been talking before about kind of performers with just wonderful chutzpah and the excitement of watching their work, uh, this is someone that I always find this, and uh, also uh, with uh, musical outfit Ben in Citizen as well. Uh, Josh Idahan. So he's here, hopefully. Uh, hey, Josh, how are you doing? Hello, Robin. Oh, my days. How are you doing? You're getting me at the best of times. I've only been up for five hours. I've got another <laughs> 24 hours yet to, to remain up. This is... Um, now, I've seen some of your kind of the, the artistic reaction that you've had during this time, both to some of the politics that's been going on and also to the kind of general cultural societal things. What have you... Because I want to talk about the optimistic things. In terms of as someone who, when I see you working an audience and when I see you playing an audience, and that, of course, is something that has been, you know, taken away from, from, from performers for the last nine months, what have you found to in any way be that kind of Nicorette patch for the excitement of playing to a live crowd? Oh, that is a good question. I would say um, I've recently joined a thing called Clubhouse, which is like, uh, it's a predominant, well, as far as I understand, it's a predominantly African-American sort of forum where people can meet and discuss uh, African-American, mostly African, uh, uh, forum where people can meet and discuss stuff. And I think that is just of, uh, it's a little um, example of how the internet and in particular social media has been really harnessed to bring us creatives and audiences who normally wouldn't be able to meet, in, you know, because of COVID, into a shared space, into a shared experience. The fact that, like, um, before COVID, obviously we, we went to shows, we went to festivals, and that was all good. Now, everyone was doing live stream, live streaming on Instagram. I was watching James Blake perform on the piano in his living room to to. to what looks like thousands, tens of thousands. I've had conversations over, I've got so many conversations over Zoom <laughs> to so many of my friends who I haven't seen in almost a year. And I, I guess, you know, first off, it, it's been kind of amazing that like on, on this, on Zoom, you can have people from all around the world all having conversations about the things that matter to them, about this, this shared experience of a lockdown. And at the same time, it's 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 helped me really treasure the fact that like I used to see these people all the time. I used to meet up with a lot of my performer friends all the time, and now I guess in their absence, I appreciate that connection a lot more. So those two things. Have you found does that change when you look at the work that you've created in the last few months? Are you able to look at some of it and go, oh, I see that because this has been created in solitude in terms of actual physical solitude, even if you are connecting with, you know, Zoom or whatever, whether you found a new way of developing the kind of the voice that you have? Um, not necessarily. I, I think it's because on, on one hand, I'm in because I live in Sweden now, Stockholm, hooray. And um, uh, they've taken the lockdown completely differently from, I think, almost everyone apart from the UK. So my experiences here has been quite different. I did spend some time in lockdown in the, in the UK before I left. So um, I, I, I kind of haven't had uh, like a, a true lockdown experience. And for me, I tend to write in isolation anyway. I'm, I'm what's it called, a hypochondriac, paranoid <laughs> writer as, the, uh, as like the best of them. So my, my default position is, oh, the world's about to end. I might as well stay at home and, <laughs> and write my will in rhyme. And, and that's always been the case for me. All that, what's really happened, it's, it's, I, I feel, is that because of what's happened during lockdown, because of what's happened during, during this year, it's really streamlined what I feel is my purpose for writing. Whereas before, I, you know, I, I often would dip in a topic and then once I've written that topic, I'd be like, OK, no, I won't do that. Whereas now I feel like exploring my own mental health, exploring blackness, exploring uh, politics have been stuff that I've really focused on and really thought, OK, you know what? If this is going to be the interesting times that the t Chinese curse has talked about, then I need to make sure that my output reflects that. And I've really honed in on that. 
Oh, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to when we can actually gig together again because there's oh, nothing I like God. more than the surprise at a festival when someone suddenly just grabs me and I think, I know who that is. <laughs> when you leave. The, uh, what, the, is the poem that you're going to perform for us today, is this something that you've, you've created recently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was thinking about it because whenever I'm invited on the show, I'm like, okay, cool, I need, I need to do something that's uh, heartwarming and pleasing. But now I thought, you know what, I, I need to respect this year. And I need to perform something that, you know, um, that came out of that sort of anguish and, and, and stress and, and, and hope as well. So, yes, it's going to be uh, a poem <laughs> that I've written this year. This is only going to be the fourth time I've performed it. So, you know, mileage may vary. Should I begin? Yeah, ladies and gentlemen who are out there, all of you watching in your attic space, wherever, whatever corner of, of your house or work you are in, still make some applause, still create that moment there of human connection. Here is Josh Idahan. Okay, cool. One more question. Am I allowed to swear? Uh, do you know what? Uh, what I'll do is I'll now do a warning. Ladies and gentlemen, the next poem may well contain sexual swear words. There we are. So you've now been warned. If you now wish to uh, move some of the older people in the room, some of your parents out of the room, you may now. Josh, you may continue. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I, I think every poet has a COVID poem of some, of some form. I guess this is mine. Uh, at several points I've thought, okay, yeah, I'm going to retire this, but then lockdown returns, we get a sequel, and then suddenly we're, we're, we're back in the scrum. Uh, this is, yeah. Tactics on survival. Everyone's coping different. Different ways, different means, different mapped out systems. Some of us are aching. For some of us, just getting out of bed is bravery. Some of us are rolling our sleeves up. Some of us are banking our faith in Jesus. Some of us don't know what to believe. And some of us mood is uh. Some of us spirit got dirt. Some of us on a path, dark, on a path on a dark excursion. Some of us are skirting around and around in the back seat with our worst emotions. Some of us are vexed at the news. Some of us are stressed out and blue. Some of us are sexting nudes. Some of us are begging to breathe. Some of us are locking our doors. Some of us are out on a march and some of us are scared. Some of us are scarce. Some of us common sense need some stars. Some of us are calling for patience, while some are rolling slave traders down pavements. Some of us are blaming the lack of stars in the dark, and some of us are doom scrolling, just can't deal with it. Logged out, flung our phones away, and allowed the whole week in it. Some of us are wrestling with grief for other stories. Some of us are blatant thieves, the effing Tories. Some of us have got private demons, public burdens. Some of us are tailor dressed in our panic. Some of us are making peace with our curses. Some of us took a peek behind the curtain, haven't been the same ever since. And some of us put our heads down, keep grinding. Some of us pushing heads down in grinders. Some of us are ghouls. Some of us are ghouls. Some of us still can afford not to mind them. And some of us have left, gone, can't find them. And some of us are crying in private. Some of us still haven't seen our grands. And some of us are living lavish for the gram. Some of us are smiling with our eyes, and some of us can't help but laugh. Some of us said we're sorry, and some have got several archive drafts. Some of us are down in that last pint slow. Who knows what next spring will bring? Who knows? Every month makes us miss the last. Is there even any hope, or is a die already cast? We all have our tactics for survival and everyone is coping different. Different ways, different means, different mapped out systems. That's me. That's my poem. Thank you so much, Josh. Where, where can people find uh, the way of accessing what you're doing at the moment? Where's the best place for them to go? Um, I'm on Twitter as at Benin Citizen, that is B-E-N-I-N -E Citizen, and I am on Instagram at at Joshua Eden. So either one of those will do. Uh, but then if, or, you know, if, if actually, you know, if you went to do, two of those sites, I talk about my other stuff relentlessly, so you can find everything from there. Thank you very much. It's always fantastic to have you at these shows. I look forward to when you will actually be back at the show on this stage. Thank you. Uh Happy holidays, Robin. Happy holidays, everyone.
His work is so good. I really love it. And uh, now we're going to go to uh, someone who uh, is part of Festival of Spoken Nerd. When I first worked them, they were scientific advisor on Blue Peter. Uh, very shortly, this is kind of, we're almost just beginning now to get towards uh, the family hour uh, where we've got a lot of kind of, we've got Bobby Seagull coming up and Simon Singh coming up. And, uh, and we're going to be uh, trying out various different kind of mathematical tests and fun stuff as well. And we will probably have an audience rejoining us in this particular room uh, as well. I hope you're enjoying yourselves at home. But uh, now, please welcome onto your screen, Steve Mould. Hello, I'm Steve Mould. I make science videos and uh, I do science shows. And in those videos and shows, I like to explain things. And so there's a few videos that I haven't made yet because I haven't figured out the explanation for the thing. So I thought uh, for you guys, I would do a little compilation of the things that I don't understand yet. So um, I've got this device here. It's a, like a remote control for a, a TV. Like if you uh, if you used your computer to control your, like if you plugged your TV into your computer and you use your computer for your TV sort of thing, then you could use this as a, as a fancy remote control. It's got keyboards and mouse, all that sort of stuff, right? Um, and it's in standby mode at the moment because it hasn't been used. And look, if I click this lighter nearby, it comes on. It comes out of standby mode. Isn't that crazy? Um, my suspicion is that, you know, inside here there's circuit boards and stuff like that. Essentially lots of little wires of various lengths and they're going to act as antenna or aerials like on a, on a radio. And <clears throat> And in the same way, they will um, they will be susceptible to electromagnetic radiation. Um, and you know, this is a piece, this is a piezoelectric igniter in here that lights the gas. And piezoelectric igniters cause a spark, and sparks uh, come with EM bursts, electromagnetic bursts, all different frequencies, I should imagine. Um, and so there's going to be a wire in here somewhere that acts as an aerial just for the right frequency. And so it, it feels a potential difference across it uh, that shouldn't be there. And it causes it to come out of standby. Uh, it reminds me of when I used to work in IT support uh, and someone said, I've got a problem with my keyboard. He had his keyboard there on his desk and, and resting on, he liked to rest his phone at the top of, in, on the little, uh, just above the uh, top row of keys, he had to rest it there. And whenever the phone rang or he got a text message or something like that, the keyboard would type random things on his screen. I think they're related. I think there's a related thing going on because mobile phones are actually quite strong uh, 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 radio transmitters. Um, my, my real question is like, you know, like I could make a video at this point because I, I've kind of got an explanation there. Not that I'm totally sure of it. Uh, not that that's ever stopped me before. <laughs> um, but the, the real mystery is like, why is this the only device I can find and this story from ages ago about the keyboard? Why is it a rare thing? Like, is this a really cheap device? And if, you know, a more expensive device would uh, have some kind of either a hardware thing or a software thing that prevents uh, sparks and uh, high strength radio signals um, having this effect? Is, is there is something that this doesn't have that other devices do have? That's the first mystery. The second mystery is to do with this. It's a, uh, a tea infuser. Oh, look at my lovely Christmas tree. Ah, oh. um, it's a tea infuser. And uh, if you run it under hot water, it does this weird thing. It's not hot enough yet. Hold on. The rest of the talk is just me trying to get the angle right. Oh, okay. It sings. What? That's weird, isn't it? Oh, look. Oh, I was trying to. I, I was trying to frame that out so you didn't see the horrible stains on our uh, kitchen ceiling. <laughs> We've been trying to get those replaced for ages. There was a leak in the in the in the bathroom above, even before we bought the house. Um, anyway, oh look, there's uh, there's some stick insects. Um, uh, for the final thing, let's go into the bathroom. 
Whoa, that sounds sinister and unpleasant, doesn't it? Um, it's not really. I just want to talk about the radiator. So this radiator here, it comes on whenever the hot water is on. Not the central heating, the hot water. It comes on with the hot water, not the central heating. Is that because like the people before us had a dodgy plumber come in? Or is there a reason for that? Does your bathroom radiator do that? Or do you have a radiator in your house that responds to the, the hot water being on, uh, not the central heating? It's a bit echoing here. I'm gonna do my final uh, one in a different room. How long have I got? Oh my gosh, one minute. So my, my kids really wanted to do their own Christmas tree. Oh, it's really, it's awful. Um, so uh, yeah, how is it? So we, we know the speed of light to infinite accuracy. It sounds like a crazy thing to say, but it's true. Um, and the reason it's true is because uh, one day we just decided we're going to define the speed of light as this specific value. We're going we're gonna to say, by definition, this is the speed of light. And you might think, well, how, how are you allowed to do that? The, way you're, the reason you're allowed to do it is because you say, well, actually we're gonna define the meter in terms of the speed of light. So we fix the speed of light, we say it's absolutely this, and a meter is how far light travels in a specific amount of time. So the meter is now defined in terms of the speed of light, which is fixed. Um, and you know, uh, you also have to have the seconds fixed as well, which is, which is defined in terms of uh, um, vibrations of a cesium atom or something like that. Um, but so my real question is like, you can't just get accuracy from nowhere. Because we know the speed of light to infinite accuracy, where where is it got like where um we must have moved the error bars somewhere. You know what I mean? If it's no longer on the speed of light, where is it? We've I guess we've shifted it over to the meter, but then a meter is just a meter. One meter is one meter. Are we saying that if we if we were to measure a meter using the speed of light? then we'd have to put error bars on that because of our inability to measure. I don't know. I just, I, I can't figure out where, where the uncertainty has gone. Now that we're certain of this thing, where's the uncertainty gone? Um, that's it. If you can help with any of those things, not that you have to, but you know, Christmas spirit and everything, uh, you can send an email to steve at stevemold.com. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much to Steve Mould. And we're now joined again with a socially distanced audience for today's Nine Lesser Carols for Socially Distanced People. Hello, socially distanced audience who are live with us here. I hope you are okay. Everyone, again, for everyone at home, everyone is masked. There's no food and drink in here. That's been, and we've kept with all the uh, COVID protocols. King's Place has been really on top of all of that stuff, just so you know. Uh, we are, I'm quickly going to find it. We're going to have a bit of kind of cartoon stuff coming up. And we're also going to have uh, various different mathematical tests coming up as well. A bit of quizzing. We've got uh, Simon Singh, Bobby Seagull. I'm going to introduce you very shortly. She's currently getting a flip chart kind of ready at the moment. But Beck Hill, who uh, some of you know that, uh, I sometimes co-host uh, Book Shambles with Beck Hill, uh, with Josie as well, of course, mainly normally with Josie, but I've done it quite a few times with Beck as well. She is a brilliant animator and a fantastic kind of frothy and creative mind. But first of all, we're going to go to uh, Matt Kemp, who, as some of you will know, for the next 24 hours, well, actually now it's about 23 hours. Well, actually, no, 22 hours. We've really only got 22 hours left. Uh, he is uh, cartooning and caricaturing throughout. So, Matt, how is it going? Good afternoon, Robin. Uh, doing very well so far. Um, happy to be uh, joining your experiment in cognitive decline and uh, capturing that over the next 20 something hours. I've already lost count. Um, and uh, I'll show you a little bit of what I've been doing. See if this works. Okay, can you see that? Yes, we've got that. Okay, so what I'm doing is basically listening to Robin and your guests. Uh, and just trying to pull out as many sort of key uh, motifs and and, uh, and fun points from from each of the speakers. That's um, fantastic. We've got the invention of bread and the invention of music there. I I think up there. Yeah, Rebecca, and, Rebecca Rag Sykes down down there. There we go. And I've just finished this one. I'm working on the next one. So uh, I've got a little bit of our music of um, of Lyca in there. Uh, more music. We've got earthworms being played to jazz too. Uh, and uh, light speed motorcycles uh, and 
what I'm doing is is once I've captured, uh, once I've finished each of these, uh, they should be going up uh, on the wall behind me, you should be able to see. So in a few hours time, you should start to see uh, an expanding tableau of uh, merriment and increasingly madness as the uh, evening and then morning progresses. Thank you so much, Matt. That's brilliant. And again, to tell anyone, if you uh, want Matt to draw something in particular, any of the kind of, uh, whether it's based around ideas that you've heard during the show or just something else within your febrile mind, uh, then uh, go for it. Just uh, if, if you, you can just uh, tweet us at Cosmic Shambles, hashtag 9Lessons24. Uh, and that also goes for anyone who's involved in the Zooniverse uh, challenge as well, which Chris Lintot set up, that search for uh, Supernova and also Helen Chersky, if there are just pictures of where you are today or anything that you've seen today uh, and she then tomorrow morning is going to put together an advent calendar where she will find science in every one of the pictures that she has chosen that you've sent in and she's going to try and find science in places where you might not think it was particularly apparent about that particular kind of scientific activity, interaction, reaction, etc. So all of that, uh, send that in Cosmic Shambles and hashtag 9Lessons24. Thanks very much for watching. Please remember Remember, if you can support us via Patreon, that is fantastic. The Cosmic Shambles Network, we're normally making four to five shows a week and uh, we really need support to keep doing that because we can't get the money that we normally get from live gigs. So hope you're able to support us. If not, hope you continue to enjoy the stuff we put out.